Let's communicate weekly. Models get kicking with flows around ghosts and five-headed goats. Yes, communicate weekly. Pinches get creaky. I'm sure you already know it's the greatest comedy show. Hello and welcome to Communicore Weekly. I'm George. And I'm Jeff. And welcome, foolish mortals, to the Halloween themed edition of Communicore Weekly. I didn't mean to call you foolish. You're actually pretty cool if you're listening to the podcast, so thanks for for listening to that. It's time for Disney History! Now, for Halloween, I'm sure a lot of other folks will be talking about their favorite spooky attractions at the Disney parks, but I'm a little more interested in one that was never built before, and that attraction is the Museum of the Weird. Now, for those of you who don't know, I've actually been working with Rolly Crump for the last uh, few years on his memoirs. It's kind of a cute story. (coughs) It's kind of a cute story dot com. And Rolly was the Imagineer behind the Museum of the Weird, so I kind of got the inside scoop about the entire thing directly from the source. Now, before I even met Rolly, he was my favorite Imagineer, and the Museum of the Weird was my favorite of all of his works. So, of course, when we started the, the book project, I, like, bombarded him with questions about it right off the bat, and I got to learn a lot about it. Yes, and, and I have to admit, I've read a few of the drafts. It's going to be awesome. Heck yes. It's kind of a cute story.com. Anyway, I'm sure that most of you guys have seen the clip from the old Walt Disney's Wonderful World of Color, where Walt and Julie Ream who was Miss Disneyland Tencennial and Disneyland's official ambassador, they travel through WED to look at all the exciting upcoming projects, meeting the Imagineers and stuff like that. Well, eventually they come to the workstation of Rolly Crump, who's surrounded by all sorts of weird models and visuals for the Museum of the Weird. Now, after all the work for the World's Fair was over and the Imagineers were coming back to WED to continue working on other projects, Rolly went back to working on the Haunted Mansion. The thing was, he got really tired of approaching it like a typical haunted house like everybody else was, with all the corny effects and like the typical horror cliches. Um, so he started doing sketches of things that were a little bit out of the ordinary. Uh, he was inspired by the 1946 French film version of Beauty and the Beast and the 1965 film Juliet of the Spirits. And he took a lot of the bizarre and surreal imagery and he started to sketch some really weird stuff for the Haunted Mansion. Yeah, he came up with a cast of characters that he thought would inhabit the mansion. One of which, and it's probably the most famous one visually that he'd ever done, was the Candleman, uh, whose fingers were lit like candles and his entire body was made of melting wax. Sort of reminds me of a Beauty and the Beast character. Hmm, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe. Uh, Well, I guess not as evil. Uh, Another was the mistress of evil, who would be a frightening female representation of the devil, uh, sort of in a way. And much like the Haunted Mansion does today, Rolly also would have employed the use of the Pepper's Ghost effect. Uh, He had this exhibit inside the museum, uh, well, it wasn't called the museum yet, but he had an exhibit in this thing called The Seven Sins of Man, where a devil creature would be standing in front of these seven different mirrors, and each one of the mirrors would use a Pepper's Ghost effect to project a reflection of one of the seven deadly sins on the devil guy before he went back to normal. It would have been really cool. Yeah, I mean, because everybody's seen the Pepper's Ghost in the ballroom scene. Yes. And in the current mansion itself. And another use of the Pepper's Ghost would have been in the library. You know, my favorite place. This would have been the very first room you walked into. Rolly designed it so that all these things, like the statues, the marble busts with the Pepper's Ghost illusion on their faces, they would talk to each other from across the room, and you'd, you'd literally be in the middle of the conversation. There was also a seance room like the Haunted Mansion has now, but Rolly's version had a chair in the center, which, uh, you know, would stand up to you, talk to you while you were in there. Uh, And, of course, man-eating plants would have surrounded you in that room as well, because who doesn't love man-eating plants? Interesting side note about those man-eating plants, he actually drew a sketch of the man-eating plants, and that sketch was eventually taken by Claude Coates 
and it was turned into that famous haunted mansion wallpaper that we all know and nice. love today. So think and of that's that. A freebie. That is a freebie. Make that's sure freebie. you you thank Rolly Crump when you when you see that wallpaper. Yeah. Anyway, so throughout the entire thing, Rolly wanted all sorts of weird architecture and themes and stuff. He didn't want it to be really obvious, but the chandelier in the ceiling would look like a chandelier at first, but there was actually a woman's face in it. And, you mm. know, the columns that were holding up the room would actually be made up of body parts. Like now, ears. Li like ears and arms <laughs> and legs. Yeah, ears, because <laughs> ears are the first thing I use to hold up anything. Of course. Of, of course. course. <laughs> but he wanted it to be, at first glance, really normal. But then when you really start to explore it and, like, look at all these little hidden details and the nooks and crannies, you would see how bizarre it actually was. And... Uh, one of these actually still made its way into the Haunted Mansion, because at the end of the ride, when you get off, they have all the wall sc scones made out of arms holding the torches. That was actually one of Rolly's ideas. Yep, I love that. I love that thing. Well, there was another brilliant model builder named Jack Fergus. He saw these sketches, and he loved them. He asked Rolly if he could build some of the models out of them, because he, he had nothing else to work on at the time, and I, I guess he didn't feel like sleeping at his desk. And so he, he built them all. And all of the models that you see in that old wonderful world of color episode are the ones that jack did uh, ultimately uh, unfortunately they were all lost or destroyed over time Sad. which is yeah it's a shame i hope the archives actually has some somewhere because that'd be that's a big loss right there i that mm -hmm. i think i love them so like i said earlier it wasn't called the museum of the we weird yet at this point it was actually walt who came up with that name uh, during a meeting on the Haunted Mansion one day, Dick Irvine sort of hid all of Rolly's designs and the models <laughs> in the corner because he thought it was too weird and Walt wasn't going to like it. But at the end of the meeting, Walt actually noticed it and was like, hey, what are these? What's going on? Um, <laughs> so Dick Irvine tried to play it off like it was nothing, but Walt was really intrigued and he found out Rolly was behind it. So he asked Rolly to pull up a chair and explain it to him. And they eventually, they wound up sitting there for three hours while Rolly went through the entire concept with Walt. At the end, Walt looked at Rolly and said, I just, I can't do his voice. Well, this stuff is really weird, Rolly. How would we be able to use all this stuff? And you know, Rolly said, you know, he didn't really know. And he just started to explain uh, that he thought the mansion needed more than just the traditional cliched scares, you know. So after a few minutes, Walt thanked him for his time and, and left. Now, after Walt just gets up and walks away from you, you kind of think that's the end of that. So, Rolly did think that was the end, and he came into work the next morning at 7 a.m., and he was really surprised to see Walt sitting at his workstation, still wearing the same clothes that he wore the day before. And he's like, Walt, wh what are you doing here? And Walt said he didn't get any sleep the night before because of all the weird stuff that Rolly showed him. And Rolly was like, I'm going to get fired. That's it. So he apologized to Walt, and Walt was like, no, no, no. I got a great idea for all this stuff. That's, that, I love that story. And so Walt explained that he wanted to put this little Museum of the Weird, as he started calling it, at the end of the mansion so people would have to walk through it before getting to the exit. And I just love that idea so much better than a gift shop. Yeah, me too. Museum of the Weird is way better than a gift shop. Way better. Uh, well, so he wanted the backstory to be that someone collected all this weird stuff from around the world and they shipped it to Disneyland. And that's how the museum wound up being inside the Haunted Mansion. Of course, I guess you really don't want people shipping stuff from all over the world to Disneyland. Yeah, I wonder where they're going to actually put it all. But it's a good backstory anyway. It's a good backstory, definitely. So when everybody else started showing up for the day, Walt launched into this big presentation for everyone about the Museum of the Weird and what they were going to do with it, and he loved it. And then as soon as he was done with the presentation, he was like, well, I'm going to go home and go to sleep now, guys. I'll see you later. And he left for the rest of the day. But the Museum of the Weird was going to become a reality. <laughs> and I can see at that point, Dick Irvine and some of the other guys just glaring at Rolly and like, okay, that's yeah, all right, we're going to beat him up later. Um, so, but unfortunately, Walt's death, which did happen not too soon after that, did bring a halt to any further development on the museum, since he really was the true champion of the project. And, you know, if Walt hadn't passed, we most certainly would have gotten a Museum of the Weird at the end of the match. Which would have been awesome. Yep. Um, but like everything else at Imagineering, ideas no don't die, they just get put away for a little while. So. Some of the weird concepts, like I mentioned before, did make it into the Haunted Mansion, like the wall scones and the mm -hmm. wallpaper. But also in the new interactive queue at Walt Disney World, there is a crypt that has musical instruments outside on both sides, and one side is normal instruments, and the other side are... It's, they're, they're instruments that are similar, if not exactly identical, to many of Rolly's designs for the museum. So it's good to see that they did use some of that stuff eventually. eventually. Yep. Definitely. 
But uh, if you want to learn more about the Museum of the Weird and see some awesome photographs, be sure to check out uh, itskindofacutestory.com or facebook.com slash rollycrumb to find out more about the book, which is coming out very, very, very soon. Yay! Thank very God. excited for this one. Me coming too. out, uh, Bamboo Press. Bamboo which Forest is the Publishing. Bamboo Forest Publishing. Sorry, I wanted to make sure that uh, Leonard was listening. Yeah, yeah. That would catch his attention. Uh, <laughs> hopefully sometime in late November, right? Uh, hopefully mid-November. Hopefully mid-November, which we're, is we're an there. awesome Christmas present. Um, they also did the Dreamfinder book, which we've talked about on the show as well. And I think people are going to be really surprised by this book. I think uh-huh. it's going to set new standards for what a Disney memoir or any memoir is going to actually look like. I certainly hope so. He's a nerd. He's a geek. Because we all like to hear him speak. So listen up to the words from his speech. Ah! It's George's Book of the Week. Our library is well stocked with priceless first editions, only ghost stories, of course, and marble busts of the greatest ghost writers the literary world has ever known. Technically speaking, I would be considered a ghost writer at this point, right? For the Rolly book? I think so. But my name Actually, is. Actually, the ghost you'd, you'd have to take your name off. Oh, never mind. I'm not a ghost writer. Carry on. Okay. Anyway, uh, most Communicore Weekly fans should be very, very familiar with that quote. Uh, arguably, and there's a reason Jeff and I have not done a Disney debate on that, uh, th- is that the Haunted Mansion is one of the greatest theme park attractions ever created. Ever. Ever. With, uh, yes, legions of dedicated fans the world over. And, you know, a-, a lot of the mystery and intrigue of the mansion lies in the fact that there has never been a complete story or history of the attraction ever published. In 2003, Jason Sorrell, Imagineer and author, wrote The Haunted Mansion, From the Magic Kingdom to the Movies, and set forth one of the most definitive histories and books on the venerated attraction. Jason also wrote a book on pirates and the Disney Mountains, which are both amazing. And this book is a must for any mansion maniac. That's me. That's all of us. Uh, Jason starts at the beginning as expected. He talks about the first vi- vi- uh, vision of the mansion. Almost said version, but vision is fine too. Uh, in a ni- it came up in a 1951 series of sketches by Harper Golf. And then from there, a majority of the book looks at the evolution of the spooky house and all of its major incarnations. We meet the legends that laid the groundwork and created the stories, like Ken Anderson, Yale Gracie, and Rolly Crump. Oh yeah. yeah. They led the initial forays and set up the foundations. Uh, the book moves through all the incarnations leading up to the final project itself. The middle part of the book tells the story of all the mansions based on the Disneyland version. We go scene by scene, looking at concept art, attraction photos, inspirations, and details. It's really an amazing section that shares all four of the haunted mansions. It's fun to compare the differences between Disneyland, Walt Disney World, and the Disneyland Paris version. And it's also a great way to learn about the changes in the mansion as the thought processes of the new Imagineers have grown and changed. Like, you know, how the setup for the Disneyland Paris ride is so vastly different from what we see in in Tokyo and Disneyland itself. It's fun to go through those. The um, third section is dedicated to that amazing film about the Haunted Mansion. I could almost hear the sarcasm dripping out of your voice when you say the word amazing. You can't yeah. use amazing and that film in the same sentence because they don't go together. No, not at all. I think uh, most Mansion fans have probably seen the film and have kind of gone, what happened here? Um, Jason takes his time. He looks at the making of the film, includes props, production materials, and photos from the set. It's a decent section, uh, but you're only going to read it once, and you may actually skim it and just look at the photos. The photos are probably the best part of that section. That's probably all you have to worry about from there. But this book is a must, must for mansion fans and theme park enthusiasts. There's no other place that collects all the information and combines it to tell the history of the spooky house. Given the number of fan-based stories and myths, I was glad to see an official source to put most of them to rest. The book is from 2003, so um, there isn't any coverage of the 2007 or 2011 updates to the Florida Mansion. But anyone who reads this book is going to see where the inspirations for the updates uh, came from. I highly recommend this book for everyone. It's called The Haunted Mansion, From the Magic Kingdom to the Movies by Jason Sorrell. It's time for Disney 
One of my favorite bloggers is Foxfur from Passport to Dreams Old and New. She's one of the few bloggers that writes seriously about the Disney parks from a design and aesthetic point of view. In 2009, she posted something a little bit different. It was an article called Goodnight George. And at first I was kind of excited thinking, ooh, a bedtime story for me, but it turned out to be uh, about the Pirates of the Caribbean and one of its more mysterious mythologies, a, a, a chilling ghost story to share with you. So before we get into it, uh, make sure you turn off the lights and turn us up really loud. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, we'll, unless you're driving. At which point, to us. at that point, close your eyes and then close turn us up eyes. really yes, loud. Perfect. And turn your headlights off if it's night. Yeah, exactly. Of course, there's totally a disclaimer spooky. here saying that don't listen to us or pay attention to us because we don't know what we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, we're clearly bad for your health. But just exactly. as as another disclaimer, this this story is not about you, right? Because I kind of got excited when I saw Goodnight George. I thought no, it would be no, like no, a, no. the ghost of the George end. Taylor. Yeah, I was sad. Okay. Oh, wow. All right. So it's not. All right. So there there are a lot of tales about ghosts inhabiting Disney attractions and other parts of the park. I mean, there, there, there are quite a few. There's a lot of oral cast member stories and traditions that haven't been recorded down, but Foxfur tells the story of George, the uh, supposed ghost of a worker that was killed during the construction of the ride in 1973. Uh, there's a quote from David Cunning in the book Reality Land that says, The most famous faux fatality was George, in quotes, the imaginary uh, welder who was killed during the construction of the Pirates of the Caribbean. The imaginary victim is most likely a Disney-fied uh, anagram of the actual fatalities at Disney World. Yeah, there's never any uh, actual evidence of the death, but that hasn't stopped the cast member tales over the years. And, and since the beginning of the attraction on December 15th, 1973, there have been strange tales of George. Most of them centered around breakdowns of the ride that were inexplicable. Uh, female cast members being patted on the head, the head, or they've had their bra straps snapped. Uh, there was even the story of an older woman that would ask for a bateau all to herself. Cast members uh, would watch the in-ride security cameras, and they would see her talking to no one in particular and crying to herself. Could this have been George's mom? Now, the town scenes in the Florida version of Pirates are dominated by this large tower pillar thing that supports the roof. Um, if you're looking at Carlos's house, who is not a chicken, um, <laughs> it's off to the right-hand side of the, ca uh, the house. Apparently, this is the tower that George fell from, um, so it's become known as George's Tower. And sometimes when you look at it, you can see a light burning in one of the windows, and that means that George is home. And when you make it to the fire scene, you're actually on the opposite side of the tower. And if you still see the light burning in George's tower, that means something is about to happen to the ride. And, and it's also reported that the tower has initials carved into the bottom of it. Apparently, you can make out a G and maybe a C. And no matter how many times that area is painted over, the initials seem to bleed through. There's also a George's door that we need to talk about. It's a special door that leads to George's tower, and what's in front of the door is the show scene that has the dog with the keys in its mouth. Now, according to this, this legend, George's door has to be closed at all times. Uh, if, it, if his door is left open, then the ride should not be powered on in the morning, because if the ride starts with the door open, then a major breakdown will happen closing the ride. And there's a fantastic direct quote from Foxfur's article, and it's as follows. Guests sometimes report seeing someone looking down on them from the Bombardment Bay Fortress, but even more uncanny things have happened, especially if the guest makes idle chat about George in the load area and proceeds through the ride alone in their boat. One guest questioned me at length about the changes to the dialogue in the attraction until finally I realized that they were telling me that the voice which originally said, dead man tell no tales was in fact saying something about the dead not having a face and furthermore had felt that many of the ride figures were visibly malfunctioning and appeared to be looking at them of course they had mentioned george's name several times to themselves while entering and although we will never be able to be fully sure of the truth of the story it does make a delightfully spooky addition to george's tale and if it matters at all, the guests seem to be honestly confused rather than deceitful and left looking unsure. Uh, I, for one, had trouble standing down and unload for the rest of the night. 
As such, it is recommended that all guests who mention or pretend to talk to George while on this ride treat him with proper respect and say goodnight to him as they leave. So I think next time we're going to have to say goodnight to George as we head out and, and kind of test that theory. Um, but the next time you're on Pirates, be sure to keep your eyes open for the light in George's tower, and there's no telling what you might see or not see. Sometimes you might see it, sometimes you don't. Hey, look, what's that? It's a five-legged goat. So at the Tower of Terror on both coasts, uh, there are a lot of references to the Twilight Zone, which is what the attraction was based on. I mean, there's so many references, I can't even begin to count all of them. Uh, from beginning to end, the fans of the series can find nods to the show practically everywhere in the entire attraction. For example, when you step into the library for the, uh, the little pre-show, you can find the fortune-telling machine, the Mystic Seer from the episode Nick of Time, uh, a bust of Shakespeare from the episode The Bard, and Henry's Broken Glasses from the episode Time Enough at Last, which coincidentally is my favorite Twilight Zone episode of all time. <laughs> and um, mine too. Yeah. <laughs> Mostly about the reading part. Exactly. <laughs> um... All the books in the library are actually named after Twilight Zone episodes, so if you look at their spines and you read the titles, you will see uh, they're all Twilight Zone episode titles. Yep, but it's not just the library that has the Twilight Zone references all over it, though. There's a poster in the lobby for the Tip Top Club, where Anthony Fremont and his orchestra are performing. Uh, Anthony Fremont was the name of the little boy in the episode It's a Good Life. And in the boiler room, you can hear the voice of the little girl from the episode Little Girl Lost through the static of the radio on the workbench. And that's one I've never caught, so I've got to go back and We're gonna have to test that listen out to it. Next test time. it out. Thanks so much for listening and watching. Yeah, be sure to leave us a comment and rate us on iTunes. Yes, because we love the ratings. And fee feel free. I was gonna say Fifi. Mm, I don't know who Fifi mm, is, weird. but that's the French from last week's episode. Oh. Feel Sorry. free to email us at communicorweekly at gmail.com with any comments, concerns, your own spooky stories, even. Yeah, if you actually, ah. if there are cast members who have pictures of the initials on the Tower of George, send them over. We'd like to see yes, them because we like have not seen them. those yet. Or pictures of the light on, too. I'm, I'm into that. I'm a ghost hunting guy, so let's do it. Anyway, like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash communicorweekly. Yep, and follow us on Twitter at Imaginerding and at Jeff Heimbuck. I'm George. And I'm Jeff. And we're from Mice Chat. Thanks so much for watching. And now the host will follow you home. <gasps> Where? I'll probably just back to my house. No big deal. Oh, okay. Okay. Ezra. <laughs> <laughs>